Hello and welcome back to Paleocast. My name is Dave Marshall and this is episode 80, Paleo Creations, with professional paleo artist Bob Nichols. This is a very special interview as it signifies the end of the Paleocast art competition, but it also falls on our fifth birthday. We'll review the Paleo Cash year at a later date, because right now I'm sure there's only one thing that people want to hear, and that's who walks away with the prizes. We received 52 entries and 3,706 votes in total. This year was especially close, with second and third places separated by just one vote. Fortunately, both won prizes in their respective categories, otherwise it would have been too close to call. Firstly, the winner of the invertebrate category is again David Clark. His entry this year, the Devonian Coral Biostrome, was yet another demonstration that good paleo art doesn't need to be about vertebrates, or nor does it even have to be on paper. In third place, and the under-16s winner, was Ply Bateman with Just Young. It's a great piece, and we all love the different techniques that Ply used in colouring and texturing his artwork. And beating Ply into second place by just one vote was Francesco Noble with lengthening shadows in the late Jurassic, in which he features a beautifully coloured stegosaur. And that leaves us with the winner, Catch of the Day by Samantha Niewarowski, who drew some fantastically detailed nautiloids, which were unfortunately about to be eaten by a giant marine reptile. It's a beautiful piece that has so much depth to it with all the different layers, so congratulations to Samantha. Bob's choice was Dominic Grabowski's Where is the Sea, There are Pirates, about which Bob said, Dominic submitted four pieces to the competition, and all of them were strong contenders. However, I chose Where is the Sea, There are Pirates, because it contains some unique features. First, the overall composition and the colour palette is descriptive and decorative in equal measure. The viewer is in no doubt about the prehistoric environment we are in, but the picture is just a few broad brushstrokes away from being an abstract piece, which is very interesting and clever. The gliding pterosaurs echo and clash with the diagonal waves, creating drama, and their wingtips lead our eyes to the wonderfully understated and ominous tylosaur. The positions of the pterosaurs also draw our eyes into the open space in the middle of the canvas, so we cannot avoid being threatened by the stormy waters. I can hear the wind and rain, and it makes me shiver. It is a painting that tells a story, but doesn't give too much away, allowing the viewer to imagine their own narrative. It is an impressive, high-level paleo artwork. So, congratulations to all those who won prizes, and thanks to all those who took part, whether that be entering a piece, voting, or just enjoying the spectacle. All of the pictures from this and other Paleocast art competitions are available on our website, so we hope you enjoy browsing those. Also on our website, we've tons of pictures from today's interviewee, Bob Nichols. So make sure you check those out too. And as always, please like, share and subscribe to our show. It all really helps. Finally, we need to pass on a huge congratulations to Dr. Liz Martin, who has just passed her viva. We'll catch up with her soon and she can tell us all about it. Until then, we hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, Bob. Thank you very much for having me over. You're welcome. Right. Let's start off. You are a professional paleo artist. Yes. So I assume that you've been very good at art from a very early age. Is is that the case? Um, Well, drawing dinosaurs is one of my earliest memories. I really can't remember much before then. Yeah. When I think back as far as I can, I would drew dinosaurs or I scribbled things and called them dinosaurs. (laughs) Um, And like anything, if you... If you do something enough, whatever it is, you'll get good at it. So I remember being the best at art at school um, in my class. That was always the case. So, yeah, I guess I got reasonably good quite soon. And that changed when I went to college, of course. Then I met other people who were good. So <laughs> I realised that I had my game. Mm-hmm. 
And so, did you always, like, you, you say that the first memory you had is of drawing dinosaurs. That never went away. You never got interested in anything else. It was just always dinosaurs. Yeah, it was the one thing, the subject that I kept coming back to. I mean, uh, there was a time uh, when the first, the original Ghostbusters film came out. I loved that so much. I drew a lot of dinosaurs and monsters. And then when I went to college, I got, you know, being a teenager, I liked music. So I did a lot of um um, album cover art and things like that but I always came back to Pele Pele art yeah it's the one thing that I've always been most interested in and excited about yeah so that interest has never left me I mean it's there have been peaks when it's been more interested bigger interest than than other times but yeah it's always been there and we always like to provide uh, artwork to accompany episodes of PaleoCast that we host on our website. Will we have any of these Ghostbusters pictures? Uh, Do you I, have copies? I, my parents have a huge pile of drawings <laughs> in their loft ranging from scribbles that were like mammoths to huge uh, drawings of the of, um, Stay, Stay Puff. Puff Man. Yeah, yeah, and the Green Blob. Yeah, they're all there. I haven't seen them for a while, so they might have been eaten by mice or something, but, yeah, but they they do exist. I can see if I can find Nichols some Nichols Originals. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. there. Right, so there's there's the interest in dinosaurs. Why why pursue the the artistic side? Why not get into paleontology itself? Uh it was never an option, to be honest. I I was born in August, so I was young for my year at school. Um, plus, I'm pretty dyslexic as well, and it was never diagnosed when I was at school, so I always struggled. They really were not the happiest days of my life. Um, I didn't pass maths and English, and I didn't pass um, science. So doing an academic, you know, a, a serious subject like science... It, as, as, as an A-level or or a degree just wasn't an option for me. It was never even considered. So fortunately, I was good at drawing. So I was able to go and do a degree and a master's degree in illustration. And um, yeah, my, like, my interest in paleontology meant I followed paleo art. That's the only way I've got into paleo subjects. To th- think that I'm now I'm co-author on three science papers is pretty crazy. <laughs> Yeah, because I have absolutely no formal science training at all. I'm just a, a prose geek. I love the <laughs> subject, yeah. So you ended up with uh, paleocreations.com. Yeah. yeah. And that's your website and your business. So how did that all get started? Well, I did a, a degree and a master's in illustration, and then I had nothing to do. And I thought, what am I going to do? I've got all this art training, what am I going to do? And I thought, well, there's one thing I've always wanted to do, and that's do paleo art. And so following my master's, I set up, might set myself up as a freelance artist, and I was told I needed a bank, a business bank account and a business name, so I came up with Paleo Creations. It was as simple as that. Um, so I chose the American spelling, because it's an easier way of spelling words, and I'm being dyslexic, I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> that makes my life easier. Um, so, yeah, it's simply the business name I chose when I was told I needed to do that. And that happened on the 8th of November, 1999. And every year I have a little celebration to think that I'm still making a living from Pele Art. To be honest, back then I never thought I could make it work. I thought it was just a dream, but I thought if I didn't give it a go, I might regret it. So yeah, every... 8th of November, I have a little celebration. For Paleo 8th of Creations. November, Bob Nichols Day. It's Paleo, Paleo Creations, Creations Day. Day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. But for me, I don't expect anybody else to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> we can all draw a picture. Yeah, okay. Yeah, to celebrate. Nice. Um, but did, did you get started with this company because people were asking you to do artwork? Or did you just say, right, I need to get myself a company and then I can start promoting myself? Well... When I was in my final year of my master's, I thought, if I'm going to be have, have a go at being a, a paleo artist, somebody who makes a living from paleo art, I needed to make contacts. So, of course, nobody knew I was even attempting to do it, so I had to go out and find clients. Certainly, nobody came into me for, to, came to me asking for work for the first two years. I had to go out and find the work, sending out samples of my artwork to different potential employers, going to conferences. Um... Yeah, so I had to be proactive, absolutely. If people think that being a paleo artist, making a living from paleo art, is just sat in front of your your a canvas or sculpting things every day, you've got you know you've got to change your attitude because it's about being a business person as well. You've got to go out looking for work, and 
yeah, you've got to promote yourself as well. You can be the best artist in the world, but if you don't get out there and find the work, nobody knows you exist. So I was very proactive, and, I, and that's kind of... It's, it was a snowball effect. I started off getting a few jobs, and they worked out well, and through word of mouth, I got more and more work. Well, we'll get more on to how you actually get commissioned and what happens uh, thereafter. But first, I'd like to get an understanding and, and tell everyone what kind of artwork you actually produce is it is it all on canvas is it digital is it models I, I have a go at everything really I like making stuff I like making pictures and building models so I've had over the you know almost 20 years now I've had a go at pretty much everything from pencil drawings to acrylic paintings to digital sculptures to um, life-size um, fiberglass sculptures uh, yeah I like to have a go at everything um, Stops you from get stops me from getting bored, and I think the more your more interest you have in your subject, the more you want to keep doing it, and the better you get. So, yeah, I'm a yeah, I kind of have a go at anything really. So, what are your favorite and least favorite mediums to work with? Um, favorite, um, I like using my new Cintiq because you know it's very intuitive. You basically just paint on the screen. That's very natural. Uh, but I also like pencils as well. There's, there's something immediate about a pencil drawing. It's just simple, no complications, and you get very quickly get a reaction, a result with pencil drawing. Um, the least favourite would be fiberglass. That stuff is horrible to use. Uh, I try to use jasmineite instead, which is kind of an acrylic, less toxic um, version of fiberglass. Um, but fiberglass is so lightweight and strong it's ideal for building large large models so it's I think it's still unavoidable really but that's definitely the worst especially on a hot day fiberglass on a hot day that is that is grim <laughs> right and what kind of organisms do you mostly draw is it mostly dinosaurs um it's I work I'm kind of, I'm pretty much a generalist I work on anything that anybody comes to me and say says they need artwork for um I like the the variation. I think the big kid in me most enjoys big vertebrates, like big mammals and big dinosaurs and anything big. Um, that excites me, I guess. Um, but the ver- yeah, variety is what keeps me interested. I think from between now and, and Christmas, I'm going to be working on um, Mesozoic mammals. So, And my portfolio doesn't have much mammal, small mammal stuff, Mesozoic mam- mammal stuff. So I'm looking forward to that. And is, is that typical of most paleo artists? Or do you find that, um, like, say, one person is a specialist in dinosaurs, the other's a specialist in fish or something? Yeah, you, well, you definitely do have specialists. Um, some specialise in the feathered dinosaurs, others specialise in, like, uh, African mammals. Um, and they are exceptionally good at that. Um, yeah, the more time you spend with a particular subject, the better at it you're going to get. But uh, I make a living from what I do. Everything I produce is commissioned. So um, I will work on, um, yeah, anything that anybody approaches me for, so long as it's a fossil, really. I don't have much interest in reconstruct and um, kind of illustrating anything that still exists. I mean, you can go out and photograph that stuff and it will be more beautiful than anything I can produce. So I enjoy the challenge of going out and it is reconstructing something that you can't exist that you can't see anymore so it's so dead it's turned to stone and i want to show people what it would have might have looked like in life that's what i enjoy so you'll draw anything for anyone in any medium but what's the favorite thing that you've ever produced um that's tricky because i think the main the thing i most want to achieve is getting better each year that i work on artworks and when that installs a kind of mentality in you that you, when you look at your own work you you kind of scrutinize it and so every time i look at my artwork i tend to see all the faults and things i'd like to do differently or should have done better so it's difficult to me to say i like much of what i've done <laughs> I, I don't look through my work and go oh wow well done or anything like that you're not I, selling yourself here. <laughs> i tend to look through it well i think this is quite common with artists actually you look at things and uh you yeah you're always trying to improve so I'm not often satisfied with what I do, but I am quite pleased like the Sitekosaurus model. That got a lot of coverage and um, it was a big part of the paper. Um, I was second author on that, so I was really proud of that. Um, to think that I didn't pass GCSE science and I was second author on that, you know, respected paper. So I was really pleased about that. Um, 
Yeah, and I just produced the artwork for the, the new uh, Nodosaur for the Royal Tyrol Museum, uh, the uh, Borea Palter. Um, I'm really quite proud of that. Considering the circumstances, I was ill during that project and I had a huge Ooh. computer crash and I had to work through the night with no sleep. So it's one of the, considering the circumstances, it's one of the works I'm most proud of. I managed to, to do something, yeah, um, extraordinary considering the circumstances, I think. Do you find you produce more commission pieces or pieces that you would draw and then try and sell yourself? Um, oh, almost everything I do is commissioned. I mean, there are a lot of paleo artists in the world, but I don't think there are many of us that genuinely make a living from it. So, and yeah, so every, almost pretty much everything I do is commissioned. I haven't done it I, at least two, for at least two years, I haven't done anything for myself. It's all been work from a brief that somebody supplied me with. So yeah, vastly more commissions than than my own work. I have sketchbooks full of ideas that I'd like to do, and sometimes I'm able to use them in the commissions I get asked to produce, but um, yeah, it's it's commissions, which is good. I'm, I'm, re- I'm, in the, I'm in the position now where I'm sometimes turning work away, which is um, an unusual position to think when I started out, I didn't even realize, you know, didn't honestly think I'd make a living from it, but now I'm turning work away, which is really nice, which is a fortunate position to be in. Yeah, it sounds good. But do you resent the lack of creativity that you can um, have with these things? The, well, I do get frustrated that I've got all these ideas and I don't have time to do them. That is a frustration. But um, I work on a lot of subjects that I would pass by if they weren't brought to me in a brief. And there are artworks in my portfolio that I would never have considered doing, featuring animals and behaviours that I would never have thought of by myself. So it, yeah, I yeah I enjoy the, the the challenge of getting a brief and thinking how am I going to bring this to life. So I'm I'm happy doing commissions. It all means also means I can make a living from my hobby, which is, which is nice. Right, so I'm an academic. I'm emailing you now about um, a new paper that I've just got about uh, the most beautiful fossil that no one's ever heard of, Limuloides Limuloides. Yeah, right. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, what's the process from there? Because I'm guessing that you don't know what it looks like. I'm guessing no one does. It's, is so, it a, a trilobite? No. No? Oh, right. No, it's okay. a Sinsifasurin. Oh, right. Okay. Oh. Right. You've thrown me then because I know I don't know that at all. So I'd first need to talk to you for a while. <laughs> say what is it yep um and then we'd collate information you'd send me what you have in terms of fossil photos and measurements and any any kind of information you have and i'd do my own bit of research as well and see what information i can pick up and i'd put it together in a big folder um and we'd talk about what characteristics and what behavior and what um, environmental features need to be put into the picture uh, then I'd produce a first draft drawing, send that to you, and then you'd send it out to any co-authors and then send it back to me with your comments. That might that will vary from this isn't working, start again, to I like it, maybe just tweak this or tweak that. And so I make those alterations and send it back to you. This is usually, tend to, well, it used to be a pencil drawing, now I do it on, on digitally. Um, and I will, this, that will, go backwards and forwards, me making alterations until we have a, a final draft illustration, um, which we will have signed off. And once it's signed off, I will then go ahead and start producing the final artwork. I'd never start producing a final artwork until I know we have an agreed composition. Um, and that, that process means that since you're spending money on this artwork, you know you're going to get the type of artwork that you want because you've seen the draft. And then I'd go ahead and finish the illustration. And then there's always a chance that once I send it to you, I can still make a few more tweaks. It's never kind of like, this is it, lump it. There's, all, there's always a few alterations at the end. Do you find that the um, process of getting those tweaks and revisions can go on for weeks and months? It can go on for a long time. Never months, because I'm always working to a deadline. So it's usually uh, a maximum a couple of weeks. Um but it can, and it varies greatly depending on the subject. If it's a subject I'm familiar with, it can usually get done in a few days. Whereas, what some of what you just mentioned to me, not having a good knowledge of what type of creature it is, that could be that could be more of a challenge. So, um, 
it would require more research and probably more drawings, yeah, and more alterations. Right. So I want my Limuloides Limuloides okay. drawing. It's is it's absolutely beautiful. Oh, and it's gonna be the best picture ever, right? Okay. How much is that gonna cost me? Can you provide me a quote? Or can you only do this retrospectively after you know how much time and effort you've put into it? Uh, well, I'd give somebody a, a rough estimate immediately so they could they could tell me whether they could afford a type of artwork. No, probably not. <laughs> but Not I, on PaleoCast budget. But, yeah, well, that's the advantage of, of having a variety of mediums that you work in. And as you say, well, I want this illustrated. And I can say, well, a pencil drawing will cost this. A, di- a, a painting will cost this. Um, a composite photorealistic artwork will cost this, a, a life-size model will cost this. So you've got always got a, a variety of different mediums that will cost a different amount. And then once I know exactly what you need, that's when I'd give you a quote. And then I'd go ahead and we'd go ahead and start doing the the, 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 the draft work, the draft drawings. Um, so you'd know how much it was going to cost before I start doing the artwork. Yeah, I certainly, I think it would be a recipe for disaster for me to make an artwork without an agreed price and then to deliver it and then maybe have some kind of dispute over what it will be paid. It's always agreed up front. Um, and if it's a huge project, like if I'm going to be spending three months producing a life-size model, I'm, I'm going to probably need um, to be paid in, in, you know, in, in parts, basically. I'm going to need an upfront payment to pay for materials and be able to afford to live those three months and then be paid the majority when it's delivered, finished and delivered. Yeah. Do you want actual prices, how much that will cost? I mean, it varies enormously. If it's just a pencil drawing, it might be £100. If it's a, a life-size plier saw head, it could be £10,000. Um, something, you know, even bigger, you know, if you're talking like a five or six metre long dinosaur, you could be talking near 20, 25,000. Um, or an illustration painting could be, well, I tend to work out how many, how many weeks is it going to take me to do and how many materials am I going to need? If it's a 3D model, you're going to need lots more materials so the price goes up. Um, illustrations, no matter how complicated or even if they're photorealistic, they never require too much material. So it varies. Uh, do you ever get asked to produce artwork for free or for good exposure? Um, in- not so much any anymore, but yes, I did all the time. I think there's um, it's a common um, problem paleo artists have, or perhaps all artists. I think it's primarily artists who suffer from this because I think people think because you enjoy your work, you should be willing to do it for free, almost like it's your hobby. Um, but, you know, ask a, an accountant to do something for free. I know accountants who love what they do. Will they do work for free? I don't think so. A solicitor? No. A mechanic? I don't think so. Why should paleo artists or any artist do things for free? If you're good at something, you should be paid for it, right? And it's skilled work. I mean, we have to put in a lot of effort and a lot of research and background work into these these artworks it takes a lot of time to get it right um so yeah we deserve to be paid for it i think yeah Yeah, certainly don't if you're if you're a young artist starting out don't be taken in by that argument you should be paid for what you do otherwise they wouldn't be coming for you if everybody could do could do this they they wouldn't be coming to ask you to produce to produce work you should be paid for it Mm. i might uh, mention that there's a donate button on the paleo cast website around about now (laughs) right yeah yeah you should do is it a big button (laughs) it's not as big as it should be okay it's not as big as it needs to be (laughs) it should be a big red button (laughs) um have you ever turned down a commission you just said like look there's there's no way i can draw this uh there's no way you're offering enough money this what you're asking is just completely out of the question yeah i I mean it's very rare that i have to say you haven't got enough money goodbye because like i said i've got a variety of different mediums i can produce artwork in so i can always adjust the style and complexity of artwork to meet somebody's budget um then i think there's only ever and, and sometimes when i'm really busy i have to say I'm, i'd love to do that but i really can't i just don't have the time if you take on too much you don't have the time and you and the quality of your artwork suffers so sometimes you have to say no um i can only think of one occasion when i could have done the work and i said no I'm not going to do it. And that was when I was uh, approached by a a creationist magazine to do a a Mosasaur painting. And they were going to pay good money for it. And I thought, I really could do this work, but do I want to produce paleo artwork for a creationist magazine? And 
Um, other people might want to, and you know, fair play to you, but that was not something I was willing to do. And I had quite a long conversation with my friends about it. It's like, sh- you know, should I do this? I'm trying to make a living from Penny Watt. Should I be selective about who I do it for? And on that one occasion, I thought, you know, who are you if you're not your your morality? So I thought, no, I'm not. I can't do that. In all honesty, I can't do that. So we've discussed in previous episodes uh, what paleo art is and how it works. But in this interview, I'm looking to get a bit more about um, what life as a paleo artist is actually like. Um, is paleo art a career that you would recommend to others? Um it, that's a tricky one because I don't, I could be wrong, but I don't think there are any jobs in paleo art. If you want to be a professional paleo artist, you have to be a freelance artist. And that's a, that's a tough lo- lifestyle for a generalist illustrator. So to be a, a specialist in a particular field, it's, it's always going to be difficult. It's going to be very competitive. You're going to have to be very flexible on your working hours. Like I haven't had a day off now for <laughs> nearly two months. Um, if, yeah, if you're going to meet deadlines, you're going to have to be flexible on things like that. And maybe when all your friends go out for a drink, you're not going to go with them. So I would recommend it to somebody who is kind of fanatical, who loves doing it and would do paleo art, even if you, it wasn't your job, because you've got to, you've got to love it. You've got to love doing it because it's going to kind of, yeah, like most self-employed people. You've got to kind of you've got to kind of live it. So that's not for everybody. So I would recommend it, um, but yeah, be prepared to sacrifice parts of your life sometimes and stay in and get some work done. And but I think that's kind of common amongst self-employment. So it's not for everybody. But yeah, I'd, I'd say have a go at it if I can do it. Right? I've got no formal science training. I'm just a dyslexic country boy who's kind of fanatical about it. So if I can do it, other people can. You just got to be willing to. You know, finance visits to conferences and get out there and meet people and send your artwork out to museums and universities. Yeah, you just got to be clever about it. Is there enough space for more paleo artists? I, I don't know. Um, there must be because I, I know I'm not able to take on all the work I'm offered. Um, so I think there's probably room. There's I think illustration is very competitive. There is never enough work for everybody who wants to do illustration to be a professional illustrator. So um, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Possibly, maybe. I don't know. It depends, it depends how much money paleontologists have. Are they likely to get more money or less money in the future? <laughs> <laughs> I think I can guess. Yeah, ask the Brexiteers. Yeah. Um, how easy is it for you to work? As in, like, uh, can you do it in front of the TV or do you need complete silence? Uh, do you have to tell your wife to get out and not come back for two weeks? <laughs> yeah, I work from home on my own pretty much all the time. So I have quite a isolated lifestyle. So I always tend to have something on in the background while I'm working, whether it's some, a DVD or YouTube or a podcast or something like that, or an audio book. I always have something on. Um, otherwise it would just be me in silence all day and I'd have my own voice and <laughs> my God, I don't want to listen to myself all day. It would drive me crazy. So uh, yeah, I, I kind of enjoy having a bit of a distraction. Um, I don't work downstairs in front of the TV because working from home is tricky. It's difficult to switch off. So here I kind of work upstairs here in my studio and I never really work, take work with me downstairs. That's kind of, that's my home down there. Um, if I don't have that separation, it becomes even more blurred, you know, work and home life becomes even more blurred. So. And you've got a daughter as well, a young daughter. Yeah, she's um, two. So surely you can't um, give it all your full attention. Something will, something will invariably come up. How, is, how easy is it to pick up your work, to put it down, go do something else, and then get back into the zone? Is that something you can do easily? Um, yeah, I can usually switch off... Um, and get straight back into it with no trouble at all. I mean, she, yeah, having my daughter in my workplace is kind of like the best possible distraction. <laughs> um, uh, but it does mean I get to see her every day, um, whereas a lot of people do, wouldn't. They'd go into work. Um, so, 
yeah, I, I'm no, I have no problem with it. I think as long as I don't ever take work downstairs, I can happily go downstairs for a distraction and and then come back up and just crack on with it. Yeah, I've never had any trouble working when I need to. I think you just need to have some good self-discipline. And yeah. I, I try to start work at a particular time every day. I have my lunch break at a particular time every day and I finish work to help get my daughter to bed. And then if I need to, I'll go back to work after dinner. So I'm quite strict on on times. It keeps me producing a good amount of work each day and each week. And is your daughter showing any uh, talent in drawing at this early age? She draws a lot, yeah. Um, she was two and a half now. But yeah, she does draw and she knows names of dinosaurs. Yeah, so she's going in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping she can help me out at some point in the future. <laughs> Um, and what do your family and, and your friends think of your career and, and how much of your life you devote to it? Um, I think, well, it's, it's primarily a source of ridicule for, for my friends. <laughs> they, think it's, they, they think it's great. Yeah, it's great material for them to take the mickey out of me, to be honest. Um, it's never ending. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, I get constantly teased that when I'm ask, asked, when am I going to get a proper job? Yeah. Um, yeah, they also think that maybe, yeah, I'm a bit obsessive. I maybe got OCD <laughs> and a variety of other uh, <laughs> mental illnesses. Um, yeah, but uh, most people kind of respect it. I think they enjoy that it's unusual. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people are interested in what I do. Um, it seems it's off, it has been in the past a, a kind of a party game for a stranger to be asked guess what he does for a job <laughs> um, and nobody ever really does and then there's the conversation it's like really what is that a job and I have to explain it's mostly not a job but um, there are a few that do it yeah so I get introduced to a lot of places as oh so this is the paleontologist yeah oh, right yeah oh you're the one I've heard about I get yeah I get introduced as um, dinosaur Bob a lot <laughs> the, 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 draw, the guy who draws dinosaurs yeah <laughs> I kind of like that, though. That's okay. I'm happy with that. Do you feel that you particularly belong to any group? Do the artists uh, think that you're not really part of them because you're such a niche paleo artist? And do the paleontologists think you're not really one of us because you're an artist? Do you? Do you? Is it a, like a little lonely clique? The paleo artists. I don't artists? know. I've I mean, I've never had. I mean, I I know that there are some paleontologists that don't have an interest in paleo art but I've never been treated in a way that would make me think that they didn't want me around at conferences and maybe they do feel that way but I've never experienced it I've always been made welcome Uh, a lot of my closest friends are paleontologists so I've never experienced that and in terms of the art I kind of maybe if I think about fine art maybe they would feel that well, one of the main things of paleo art is you have to try and learn so much about the subject that you're reducing the air, the, the gaps for self-expression and speculation as possible. You're trying to reduce those by informing yourself as much as possible about the subject. So there, it isn't about maximising self-expression, which fine art often is. So there is a big disconnection there. I think a lot of fine artists might say that paleo art is illustration but then if you get five paleo artists in a room and get them to illustrate the same subject you're going to get five pretty different artworks so there is a lot of self-expression there so that's an interesting argument but I personally have never experienced any kind of um, anybody talking down their nose at me or in a disrespectful way or a patronising way or any way to suggest they didn't want me around Maybe I'm just not very good at picking up on the signals, <laughs> and I don't. I don't feel like I belong. Oh, actually, I do. I feel like I belong to the paleontological community more than I feel like I belong to the art community. I think. And then finally, just to wrap it all up, what's the highlight of being a paleo artist for you? For me, it's it's doing my my hobby as a job. I would do this in my spare time if I if I wasn't if I had to have another job. This is what I do. It's something I've never lost interest in doing. Yeah, this is me, really, is paleo art. So 
getting up every day and doing it as a job, even when you have tough times and difficult deadlines and you might be drawing the 100th Tyrannosaurus Rex that year, they're still amazing animals and uh, I never get tired of trying to make them look real and bring them to life. All right, Bob. Well, thanks for having us over. You're welcome. It's been really good fun. Thank you. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Joe Keating, Laura Soll, Liz Martin Silverstone, and Caitlin Colary. It was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash paleocast to get all the latest news.